Hello, everybody. We have made it to episode 250. We're recording this live on July 7th, 2022. This is Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Hello. Hi, Barry. We got a great show for you all tonight. We're going to be talking about human factors and usability implications of double-decker airline seats. We're also going to be answering some questions from the community about job titles and human factors, the stress and demand of everyday work in this career, and how to present summaries of user flows. But first, some quick programming notes and community update. We did round out last month. Last month was Pride Month, uh, and we launched kind of a huge information campaign. Just want to draw attention to one of the pieces of content that we pulled out, one that we haven't done in quite a while, which is a deep dive. And on this most recent deep dive, it was into the uh, sort of inclusion in the design process for LGBTQIA plus individuals. It's actually a piece that I am really proud of. I did not write this. Uh, someone in our lab wrote this. Katie uh, wrote this. It is a phenomenal piece. I recommend everybody go read it um, and include it into your process because it just talks a lot about inclusive design and sort of, um, you know, how how we can sort of design for everyone, not, not, just, uh, not just the 90% or whatever, you know, and goes deep into the human factors connections as well. Anyway, that's a quick aside but barry i want to know what's going on with 1202 well just for do 1202 it's worth saying that actually all the content that was produced by the team in the lab over pride i thought was exceptional there was a whole lot of stuff there a whole lot of resources that i thought were um, really really cool but over at 1202 the latest episode has gone live nearly forgot to do it um when i was sort of mentioning in the pre-show here that um that there was a lot of social media stuff that i didn't forgot to put out but it was an interview with david go lightly now Dave is a lecturer at Newcastle University, um, but he's done a lot of work in the in the rail industry. Is you know he's he's done quite a broad range of things, but the work he's done in rail, really bringing together that academic and the industrial look into all different parts of um, in all in different parts of rail, from freight all the way through to station design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it was interesting the way that he was doing a lot of work that was that you'd think. That most of the stuff that we would do would be around just purely the passenger experience. But it was actually more the background stuff that led to good passenger experience and therefore led to good productivity um, for the um, for, for the rail network, which is something we don't necessarily focus on as human factors practitioners stuff. We don't necessarily think about the complete end-to-end -end stuff. And that was really fascinating. But also a lot of people got involved in the social media feeds with this. Um, and there was a, quite a few railway-based jokes. Uh, based on this, we tried not to put too many in, in the episode, but um, but after a while, it all became a bit much. So on that, Nick, I suggest you you get us back back, uh, back on track. Chugga chugga choo choo, all aboard! Yeah. All aboard the news train. This is the part of the show where we talk all about human factors news. Barry, what is the story this week? So the story this week is about what it might be like to travel on a double-decker airplane seat. So flying economy for any extended period of time is an experience usually endured rather than enjoyed. Uh, but an airplane seat designer thinks their design could revolutionise budget travel. In many ways, it's really got to be seen to be believed, and I recommend that anybody follows the link to the article that's going to be in the description. But to try and describe it, the concept takes... It, you get rid of the overhead lockers in the aircraft. And instead of instead of having them, you put put another layer of seating on top of the 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 lower seat, but for in front of you. So it's almost like the sat in the lap, um, which which is interesting. But you can sort of see it when when you see the picture. So the purpose has really been to change the economy class seats because the designer claims for the better of humanity, or really for the people who cannot afford to pay for those more expensive seats. But whilst some people have been saying, actually, wow, this is amazing. You'd be using better use of the space. People can um, stretch out the legs and things like that. Others are really more concerned about like claustrophobia and convinced that sitting underneath somebody else would be worse, not better, than the current economy set up on an aeroplane. To describe it in a bit more detail, effectively, the top level has been designed with two ladder-like steps for the travellers to use uh, to access that top level. It's described as a little bit precarious, but once you're up there, the seat is roomy, it's comfortable, and there's plenty of room for stretching out your legs, which as a uh, longer leg person, I think is the ideal. It's, you're always looking for to be able to stretch out your legs. 
And as the overhead lockers have gone, there's there is now space, or the idea is to have space in between the top and the bottom levels for travellers to stow their their um, cabin luggage. Then everybody's thinking about what about the person at the bottom. So in the bottom row, really again they were looking to aim to address that lack of leg room, and this offset design does allow for the passengers at the bottom to stretch out their legs as well. But because the other level of the seats are direct, directly above them and in your eye line, people who've tried it suggest that it does feel a bit claustrophobic. But then again, if you don't mind tight spaces and you're planning to simply sleep all the way through the flight, it could be an effective solution. So this idea of the, the chaise long seat was initially envisaged for the fl uh, Flying V Del aeroplane, which is a new airplane concept currently in development at Delft uh, University of Technology. The designer thinks that the design could be implemented in anything like a Boeing 747, an Airbus A330, or any other medium to large wide body aeroplane. So Nick, would you be taking the top seat, the bottom seat, or is it not for you and you just wouldn't bother? Yeah, if I'm the top or the bottom, uh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, for me, uh, there's, so this, let me just put it this way. Show notes, this were very easy because um, <laughs> I threw a lot in there. Uh, and <laughs> It to me, and this might be just me. I'm thinking about all the things that us as practitioners, designers, engineers have to think in order for this to happen before I even entertain the idea of whether or not I would enjoy this space. So, putting all that aside, I'm going to do that live right now. Would I enjoy sitting in this space? I don't know. Um, I think the bottom would feel quite claustrophobic. I don't know how I'd feel sitting up on top unless I was sort of. Uh, really in, you know, towards the window. Are there windows on top? I don't know. Uh, and so that's, these are all things that I would think about, but um, I don't know, this this whole thing, and I do want to draw attention to one thing before we continue. You kept mentioning a designer. This this person who designed these seats was 21 at the time of submitting this to uh, the, uh, I, forget, I forget what it's called. It's the um, Crystal Cabin Awards, uh, which mm -hmm. is a prize for sort of a design within uh, air, uh, airplanes, the airplane cabin space, I should say. And so this is coming, coming to us from a 21 year old. And I don't want us to be too hard on that person because they are really trying to think outside the box here. Um, and so we'll look at it with a human factors lens. We'll try to approach it from a sensible perspective. Um, but I really do want to sort of, uh, encourage younger folks to continue to do this type of work. Think about other ways in which, um, maybe traditionally would have been, I don't know, uh, people would have put up a, a barrier because they said, okay, that's way too much. We can't think about everything. We're going to do that tonight. We're going to think through some of the implications and what it, what uh, all that means. But Barry, I'm curious what your kind of key or initial thoughts on this story were when you saw it. Oh, when I, re when I saw it, I've, I'd sort of seen it a few times. Uh, I think it's brilliant. I think the for almost exactly the reasons that you just highlighted, it's somebody's taken the idea and gone, actually, we could do this differently. We don't know whether it's better or not, and you won't know until you get into decent user testing and all of and it is you know, it's at that concept stage. Um, and there is loads of stuff, and I think hopefully that some of the issues that we'll bring out will um, you know, provide some some almost direction in maybe in, in the way that they they develop the system. But I really like the idea that um that we've tried to use that space more effectively. We, we're not just being, um, they're not just going with the tra traditional way just for the sake of it. So I, I would like to think that maybe I, I wouldn't like to sit in that seat as it currently sits, so to speak. But um, I think some evolution of that, I think there is definitely going to be something there that could be a lot of good fun to, a lot of good fun to work with. So I could, I could easily see this double, uh, double stacked approach in the future. And now Nick hasn't joined us. So Nick has uh, decided to leave us. I've clearly bored him with my ideas already. So what we will do now is um, we'll give Nick a moment to, um, so to see if he's going to come back because then he'll just cut this bit out of the edit anyway. Um, but if not, then we will just crack on and keep evaluating it. But he's, yes, he's not going to come back. So Really, the, the first element that we would want to look at in this, as we've been going into, we've been looking at breaking down all of these stories by the, sort of these five main elements. So really, when you want to look at it from a personnel perspective, 
there's a few things that having um, something more up in the air. So if you imagine that this this first uh, the, this top row is kind of up in the air, you've got to get up and get up with um, up, up, up a small ladder to go and get to it. It's almost like the, like the issues that you've got when with with the, a traditional bunk bed almost. Um, and being able to play with that. So how would you engage with um, with the things you normally do around that space? And some of the things that have been highlighted is like, if you've got children, when you want to let children out, when normally you'd let, you know, as annoying as it is, you let them um, wander around the seat area, wander in the aisle because there isn't very much space. Small children don't really understand the need to be shut in a very small can, especially if you're going... For a, for a number of hours, so you need to have that space to let them let them do that. Would would the, um, their lack of awareness of, of a fall element there mean that they couldn't go into them top rows? And then going taking that one step further, there is people who just wouldn't be able to physically get into them spaces. Therefore, does that mean actually them top levels become a bit more elitist? The fact that you can only go in them if you're if you're uh, fully able bodied. In, in the same way that you, if you want to sit on the um, on on the aisle that has the emergency exit, you have to be a fully able-bodied person in order to be able to operate that um, that emergency door, um, which is something I quite like to do because I've got longer legs and they normally have um, uh, have uh, more space there. So I could sort of see that being um, a bit a bit of an issue. Nick, have you got any? Now that you've decided to come back and join yeah. us. Um, have you got any thoughts on the on you know what is it about people that we need to think about when looking at these seats? Yeah, I'm going to jump down to sort of you t- you're talking about various conditions that people are that I guess attributes that people have, and I'm wondering you know with with respect to these seats, is there still going to be sort of an ADA section, um, American Disabilities Act for mm-hmm. um, for you over there in the UK? But basically, we're talking about you know disabilities, wheelchair, that type of thing, but not every disability is visible. So those, uh, you mentioned it in the blurb, but I think those with mild cases of things like anxiety or claustrophobia, those uh, might be exacerbated by the exceeding arrangement. And so how do you account for that? Do you have sort of the normal seats, like, you know, I don't know, 10 to 12 normal seat rows in the back that would accommodate for this and the rest of them are like, you know, loaded up. And then the other thing that I am thinking of when you're talking about the seating arrangement, just generally, is sort of the user interface of the the applications that you use, you know, the airplane apps that you use to pick your seat. What does that look like? Because do you make the plane twice as long now that you have so many seats? How do you indicate top versus bottom? You're inter- introducing a whole other dimension mm-hmm. with that upper level that you didn't have before. And then also, how do you select ADA seats or seats that are going to be accommodating to your conditions? And so I'm thinking about a lot here. Um, and like I said, this was one of the easiest things for me to write up in terms of show notes because there's a million different issues that I see. Uh, what strikes you, Barry? What where do you want to go next in this conversation? Well, I mean, for me, I guess an easy one to knock out to begin with would be that 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 training aspect because we we go on to we go onto an aircraft and we're all trained to or you know um, culturally trained now. You you go onto it, you pick your seat, you make sure that you've got enough um, arm room. You have that that little bit of a fight with either the person who sat next to you. The um, the air crew give you the briefing, which you now largely ignore, which is something we covered on a previous episode. And you you know you you kind of into it. You you put you know where your baggage goes. You roughly know what's going on. This is going to take. This is going to be a, a bit of a, a shock to the system in many ways. You know when the A three eighty came out and it was double decker, um, a lot of people said that that couldn't happen and 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 that type of thing. It's a different way of of thinking. So. You're going to have to learn how to deal with that because it's going to you're going to behave differently because you're going to be in that enclosed space. How are you going to you know how you interact with the the people either side of you if if it is going to go three in a row? So there's going to be them sort of things that unofficial conditioning is going to have to change. But then also, what about flight crew and and the flight attendants? They're going to have to have new training packages. They're going to have to know what to do differently in this type of aircraft because if they don't all go like this we're going to have wait loads and loads of different types of aircraft um and so what do they what will be the 
um, that the, the 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 burden, uh, the training burden there, in having for, for flight crew in having to recognise the the special needs that this is going to have because it's going to have special needs, which I think we'll talk about with the engineering bit. But how to manage your passengers is going to be very very different. I can see just because you've got them two levels. The if nothing else, at that top level, when you press the call attending light, um, they come along. They are they going to be busy staring at your cr- at, the, at the crotch level? Uh, so you trying How to can I help you, up? sir? Yeah, well, yeah. Are you, you going to be handing food up? Are you, um, you know, what are the what are the issues uh, associated with that? Um, yeah, they, I think there's going to be some interesting pieces on that. But I think, you know, that th- this is all small fry stuff. I think that the real meat of this sandwich, so to speak, is in the is in the engineering. Do you not think? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I think there's if we're talking about solutions i'm wondering if there's going to be like a just really quick a double decker serving cart where you know they have a step stool that allows them to raise themselves up uh to get on their level and maybe you have one person serving the top and one person serving the bottom as they cart it along you know genius so yeah i just thought of it you're welcome there's the patent um and so <laughs> There's, you know, there's solutions, but there are going to be new ways to do that, right? How do you mount up the uh, the flight attendant on that platform? You know, how does it, how do you store it? How do you access the things down below in a way that's not going to, I don't know, interfere with your ability to hand it to people? I Because there's a specific... And Nick now decided that he doesn't want to talk to us at all. Um, so yeah, if we dive into that engineering piece, then for me, as I said, this is where I think most of the fun is going to is going to be, because firstly, let's look at this in terms of the idea was meant to make um, budget aircraft or the budget area, the economy seating area, to be um, to be better. So. What is invariably going to happen, undoubtedly, um, flight uh, aircraft um, air, aircraft manufacturers and um, airline um, executives are going to look at this and say, "Brilliant, we can fit, you know, half as many people again onto onto this aircraft." Now, I guess you got to look at that and say, "Well, is that actually true?" Because if you can fit, you know, half as many again people on the aircraft. Then will the engines take it? Will the will it be um, will it be certificated to take that amount of load? Because most aircraft have to fit with have to work with intolerances, and so if you're retrofitting current aircraft, then um, you I, I cannot see that you're going to be able to just turn around and say right we can take half as many again people because it just the 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 weight of the aircraft um, that it can work within just won't take it. But say we have new aircraft. And and it's built with this in mind. Therefore, you know your um, the landings, the landing systems, the and all the all the um, the capability of the aircraft is therefore designed to take in another half again amount of people. If you've got all these people, then they are going to need to get on that aircraft. And we all know what it's like to, when you go down to the uh, to go down to the boarding area. Um, you, you go down to the gate. Gates are already um, one of these places that's quite quite cluttered up already when lots of people are there and how fractious do you get when you're standing in line waiting to get onto a flight so when you try and get onto the um onto that it's going to take you know half as long again to get on the aircraft if it isn't well managed well facilitated so the systems are going to have to be in place in order to make the onboarding of the um uh, the passengers to make that as as quick and easy as possible so as we've already said, in the terminal itself, there's going to be less waiting room. There's going to be more in more need for staff to be there to to deal with angry people um, and things like that. So you're going to need more staffing around that terminal area. Um, but if we've got more, but just because you've got it in that terminal area, it then that um, uh, rolls onto the rest of the um, the rest of the facilities, the rest of the um, the airport. Does everything there actually? fit 
um, this new abundance of um, a, a new abundance of people in there because it, all the people who are um, it isn't just the people coming through that you need to um, to think about, but it's all the people who make this sort of stuff happen. So your security staff, your um, your airline crew, um, airline staff to get you know to issue tickets and make sure you all the, uh, do all the seat allocations. All the people in the, who you don't see that make all this happen. So, because you, if you've got more people, you've got more luggage. If you've got more luggage, you're going to have to have more um, systems that can that can cope with a lot more um, a lot more luggage going through there, and it be robust. Um, and if we haven't got this overhead space on 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 the aircraft, like in the article, we, they did say that they've engineered that space in elsewhere, but. Um, are we going to have to even more reduce the amount that people take into the cabin? Therefore, we, we're going to need more space on the aircraft to actually store all this luggage. So th there's a lot of um, knock-on effect, I think, with with a lot of this. Um, and that's even before you get into it. So all we've talked about really at the moment is, is systems around um, the supporting of, of the number of people. When you get into the actual seat itself, there's going to be all sorts of issues to play with. So firstly, the we're getting very popular now, rather than um, in modern aircraft, rather than having the air crew standing up and give you a safety brief, you watch the video in front of you. So we need to make sure that that video, um, that, that the video screen that's mounted into the seat in front of you, which is now going to be mounted into the bottom of the seat in front of you, um, is going to have to be um, at, the, at the right eye line. It's going to have to, you're going to have to be able to control that easily enough. It's going to have to be um, make sure that that that, that works is not too close to your face. Then you've got everything um, around the seat itself. How do you make sure you've got enough movement in the seat to allow um, an ergonomic uh, fit when you sat when you sit down? But with the way that that seat is set up at the moment, it looks like it could be fairly limited in terms of movement. That we don't know yet. Um, so we we need to play with that. So we'll we'll sort of see how that all rolls through. But then it, it's not just when you're sat there that it's important, but it's you're, you've got to transition in and out of this seat. Um, and Nick, I don't know if you've had it before, where you, if you're sat in the middle seat of an aircraft that um, that you have to get out, you have to do that whole, oh, please, can I, can I just get by? How much worse is that going to be when you've got not only somebody sat beside you, but this other seat right in your face? Right. Yeah. Well, that alone is going to be difficult for the middle seat, but it's going to be even more difficult for those on the complete edge, right? Because that's two people that you have to make it through. And if you look at the illustration or even the the you know physical mock-up that they built, that's a really tight space. You can barely get your knees in there on the top, on the top level, right? It's very claustrophobic on the top. How does the person up against the window get out of there? I don't know. It's a lot to think about. Um, you know, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the some of the issues that maybe we didn't think about as much before the last couple of years here with transmissible diseases. When you're that close to other people, um, you're you're very close in proximity, and so thinking about you know virus, cold, cough, those types of things. How does being this close to others affect transmissibility, especially when um, I don't know if you mentioned it, Barry, but you did mention this on the post show last time, so I'm going to bring up flatulence. Uh, when that's like right in your face, when you're like kind of in the bottom row, you know, it's something that you have to consider, right? Um, beyond that, right? There's a uh, other sort of social, or or uh, I guess aspects of how is the public going to um, give this? A lot. Of design, right? so, I don't so yeah, I mean it's it, it, it is going to be interesting, isn't it? Because if you have something like this, like we said earlier, this is such a um, a dramatic change to to what we're doing because you're going to interact with people in um, in completely different ways, and so we're going to have to do this whole piece um, in a, in a way that. You, you, we've got to be able to roll it out. So it's it's one of these things. How do you do that that sort of campaign that that normalizes what we're doing? What what's an interesting piece with this is when people I've never had the luxury of flying first class, for example, but you see the videos of people in first class that luxury where they get beds and all this sort of stuff, and this is almost going the other way. Um, 
in a, you know, but in instinctively you have people to um, to take you along that journey. So it goes back to almost that training issue that it will happen um, if if this t- sort of concept was was involved. But it will take it will take time and. And it comes into an issue that I think we'll get into into later on about sort of culture and behaviour. But then, just to get back to that sort of that system safety thing that you were sort of talking about, the you know as well as you're right, we we sort of we we're all very nervous now about getting into into sealed cans um, and things because of uh, our experiences with, with COVID. But even just on the on the real basics, if we're going to try and get into into this high seat, what happens if you you know, as you're trying to clamber up this seat, um, you know, there's quite a few people who maybe get on board an aircraft with having had one, one or two half lager shandies in the aircraft in the airport before they left. What they might miss the footing um, and fall off, which would be um, a bit of a disaster. But even then, just like they might not fall off, but an errant foot might go and kick the person below in the face. For example, if their face is quite close to the ladder and your, your foot slips, it's not where's that foot going to go. Um, there doesn't seem to be that much space around that for that foot to go and go and disappear to. Um, and then when you come into you come into land, and invariably the same thing happens, even though you're told quite categorically keep seat belts on and keep sat down until the um, until the complaint comes to a complete stop and, and the seatbelt sign has been switched off. Well, that clearly never happens because everybody starts rooting around. They have to get the luggage out. Right. They have to get out of where it is, and they have to get into that thing because they have to be first off that aircraft. Now you've got now you've potentially got another half as many people again on there. Um, everyone's going to bail, going to bail as quickly as possible. Um, and what about emergency situations, Nick? How do you think emergency situations are going to change in this scenario? Or do you think it's going to be one of these things that um, this type of thing? If we don't train people properly, if we don't give people the right sort of input then the um what's that going to do to the to the likelihood of fatalities i mean for me i can only see it's going to go go one way um but if you've got it so the there's a number of emergency exits that currently exist we know that there's that there's two at the front and the two at the back and i'm doing the cool little um uh, the hand signals that we all know and love um are we going to have to put more in um to to make that actually work properly but there is the engineering side of this, I think there is going to be an awful lot there um, to get into. But as Nick mentioned right from the start, then this isn't a design that is going to that is there now for to, that's going to be installed. It is a a concept that's been done by a twenty one year old student, and so all this is sort of stuff that really will good usability testing will will bring out, and therefore I think that'll be quite good. What is going to be quite interesting i think is when we look at the at the organizational and social aspects of this nick already alluded to it with the you know if you're having to pass out drinks um to various people how do you um, not only mechanically get up there from an engineering perspective but how do you work um work both of them elements um how does your you no know, socially how does your relationship with other passengers work and Really, I guess a question for me that, um, and I think Nick, you guys have in episodes, and apparently there was episodes before I came along. I didn't know this, but you guys have been doing episodes for a long time. Oh, yeah. um, you, you've been talking about um, different cultural divides that different types of technology would bring. What do you think that the cultural divide will be between this? Will it not just exacerbate that divide between rich and poor? I don't know. Will it? I mean, it, it will the Will the cost of seats differ depending on whether you're up top or down below? I don't know. What is the pricing structure? That's something else that we have to consider. Um, it will certainly be a divide between able-bodied and unable-bodied, or or however you phrase that. I don't. I don't know. Okay. Right. There, so <sighs> there's going to be the. I, I mean, you kind of get it now with you. You take the seats that have the larger legroom because you can open up the door. But this is going to be that times however many seats are stacked up against each other because you have, you know, um, all those people on top need to be able to get down quickly. And the people on bottom need to be able to get out into the aisle without any issue. Right. So do you need to have like twice the amount of emergency, uh, you know, exits? I think that that is yes. (laughs) Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Barry, do you have any other closing thoughts on this story? Oh, I, yes, I think, I mean, for me, this is fascinating. I, As we said from the off, I think the, I really like the idea that somebody's taking this and thinking out the box. Um, I think there is a lot that engaging a human factors practitioner in this will help this design, help this design evolve. I think it's got legs for want of a better, want of a better word. Um, I just, it, it, but the, there is, there's a lot of um, HFE to be done here. And there is, I think there is a massive amount of social element. Um, Nick, what do you think? Have you got anything, any final things? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts that I wish I could have talked about, but internet, uh, you know. <laughs> so oh, I'd do all that for you. Um, I know. But... I hope you enjoyed talking about this story, Barry, because I, I was really looking forward to it. Anyway, uh, thank you to our patrons this week for selecting our topic. And thank you to our friends over at CNN for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, we do post the links to all the original articles on our weekly roundups on our blog. You can also join us in our Discord for more discussion on these stories. You know I'll be there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be seeing what's going on in the community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Yes, huge thank you as always to our patrons. We especially want to thank our honorary Human Factors Cast staff patrons, Michelle Tripp, patrons like you keep the show running. And not only do you keep the show running, you keep our lab running too. Did you know that we have a digital media lab? Um, in fact, I alluded it to it during the pre-show tonight. Um, we are working on some really exciting things that we can't quite talk about yet. Uh, but a lot of them you already seen. So some of the Pride stuff, uh, all of the Pride stuff actually last month, came directly out from our lab. Uh, lots of really bright minds working on that stuff. Uh, we are focused on communicating human factors in a fun, entertaining way. Um, like I said, we have some exciting projects we can't talk about yet. If you want to get involved, reach out to us. We, we may be able to find some room for you. Um, you can also get some work experience on some real world tools. Uh, and hey, that deep dive that I mentioned at the top, that's something else that the lab has produced. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of really cool things coming out of there. We always like to take a little bit of time every now and then to mention that that is a thing. So maybe check it out. Anyway, we're getting into this next part of the show. It came from. That's right. It came from. This is uh, where we search all over the internet to bring you topics the community is talking about. Uh, and no matter where you're watching, listening, I don't know how else you're absorbing this, hearing. Anyway, give us a like, a heart, a thumbs up, wherever you're at. It helps other people find this content. All right, we got three tonight. Um, first one here is from the Human Factor subreddit. I always like it when we get them from there. This is by user I Got Qualms talking about job titles. This is specific to the Human Factors field. So I'm a couple months away from completing a master's in Human Human Factors, and I've been looking into the job market. I've Googled jobs titled Human Factors, Ergonomics, User Research, etc., but there don't seem to be very many with those in my city. What other jobs could I look up that'd be relevant to my degree? I live in England, if that helps. So, Barry, I'm hoping for like a UK perspective on uh, some of these job titles. What does it look like over there? What are y'all called? I would say, I, didn't, I hadn't read, read in the pre-show, actually, that this is um, an England person because I'm very surprised that um, using them terms, you haven't found acres of jobs or you live somewhere so remote um, because... The English, the English or the UK um, economics job market at the moment is massively buoyant. It's very, there are so many jobs out there. Um, 
so I, I don't know, change your search engine maybe. Um, but I would uh, reach out to the Chad Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors, go on their website. There is jobs posted up there. Um, but to be honest, those the, the terms that you're going for are, are the terms I'd be I'd be hitting. Um, go and maybe the other bit I would do is go and look at specific um, uh, specific employers. So if you want to work in things like defense, rail, um, um, the nuclear things like that, go and couple up these search couple up these terms with them um, with them domains because they are I can um, almost definitely say that their 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 jobs are out there using them terms. Yeah, I I mean like I I'm in the same boat, right? It, for for me, a lot of those jobs using those terms, you'd come back with some results, and I'm wondering what parameters are you using to filter? Because if you are just looking at geolocation, well, yeah, if you are remote, you're going to have a hard time um, unless you find somebody doing remote work. But for something like ergonomics, it's a little harder to do. There's other titles, I guess, that you can look for, right? Human factors engineer is one of them. Um, and it's going to, sometimes it varies by domain. You might just be called an engineer or usability specialist, or, um, you know, if you're in tech, it, it could be UX researcher, you, you know, could be UX. So there's, I don't know, there's a, I don't know why you're, I, I'm coming up with a blank too. Barry, I was really hoping that there's something unique about the UK that's just, you know, odd. But uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I would, I would say, I mean, having said that there's tons of jobs out there, there is still, it is still a niche market compared to software, um, you know, all these standard engineering, uh, things like that. So comparatively, yes, there's fewer jobs. Um, and I guess most of them jobs do, uh, I don't know whether I'll go and push myself out there and say this, that they're clustered around places like London, Farnborough, Bristol, um, Cardiff, um, some north or around the sort of Preston area, um, Loughborough, um, but there are dotted up and down the country, um, northern, northern Scotland for set some some say critical work. So they are they are they are definitely out there. What I would say, make some connections. Maybe uh, maybe join our Slack and or, or our Discord and talk to Mister Barry Kirby. See okay. see if he has any other thoughts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's get into this next one here. How stressful, demanding, or intense is this job or career? This one's actually on the user experience subreddit uh, by Psykit. But uh, what is your work-life balance like, mostly in terms of working hours or having to take your work home with you? I've worked menial labor jobs where it's clock in, clock out, mindless kind of work. I'm just scared that I won't be able to adapt to a high-stress, fast-paced, highly competitive, and demanding workplace or lifestyle, assuming that might be the case. Barry, how stressful, demanding, or intense is your job or career? Um, without wanting to put people off, they, this is what I love about the human factors world is I think you can make it as high or low stress as you want to have, depending on the role that you go into. So mine personally is quite high stress, but then I run my own business and I'm going to look after staff, I'm doing various bits, and I have a quite a high um i guess threshold for quality and, and things like that so I, I don't like to be sitting around doing nothing i'm always trying to bounce around new ideas and, and push stuff out but equally i know that there are loads of other roles out there that are i wouldn't say menial but they are clock in clock out you go in you do the job you leave again and it's not mindless um because i don't think any i don't think i've ever been in any role in HF that, that, I, that I could call mindless. It is because there's always something stimulating. This why, I guess, why we do the job. Um, but there are more what more roles there that are better for a work-life balance. My work-life balance is largely rubbish um, because running my own business, I'm particularly being a family business now because not only does my wife work, for, uh, work in um, our company, but also my daughter does now as well. Um, so it is, you know, it, it has been made part of our living and breathing. So, I'm a bad example, um, but they, you shouldn't be scared about joining about about um, joining somewhere that because it because it being ha, um, high stress and fast paced. There are loads of jobs out there that allow you to you know almost pitch it to be right for you. So just just go with it and see what you think, Nick. What do you think? Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, it really does depend. Hit the button for. Um 
how you approach your job because and the company and values that they have too. For me, I am uh, like, I'll, I'll give you all uh, insight, right? I was banging my head against a wall yesterday to trying to get something to make my job easier, to, you know, full, full, full disclosure. I was trying to do some things that wouldn't quite work. Um, and it got to the point where I felt like physically queasy because I was like sitting at my computer, just going, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? That's a, that's a, that's a rarity where I feel that. Um, I value work life balance very much to the point where, um, you know, three o'clock every day I'm done. Um, and you know, unless there's like a really important thing that I need to do or I'm on travel or something like that, I'm done. Uh, don't schedule me anything after that. Um, and fortunately the people that I work with respect those boundaries. And I think part of your success with making it or preventing it from being a demanding or intense job is setting those boundaries. Don't allow people to kind of walk over you and say, you know, I'm done. I'm out of here. Do not contact me until tomorrow unless it's like, you know, a real emergency. Uh, and the other thing I'll say to that is that, you know, you, you, in terms of taking work home with you, um, I work from home, so it's here, but also at the same time, I can leave my desk, go sit down on the couch with my wife and son and still be thinking about work. And you know, I consider that still working if I'm working through a problem or something. And so there's like, you need to think about what that actually means. Are you the type of person that will perpetually think about how to better something like Barry or myself, you know, or are you somebody who can turn it off, which I envy you? Um, because it's, if it's like a faucet for you, you turn it off and, and go, um, then those are two very different types of lifestyles that you'll live. Like I can say I'm done at three and I will be done at three. I'm not going to sit at my desk past three, but I might think about something. Um, but I won't go back and, and work on it until after the next day has started. Right. So just thinking about that. I don't know. Any other thoughts on that one? No, not really. I think it's, it is that case of, um, I think HF is, Human Factors is better generally at recognizing, certainly if you're working in an HF team, we are sometimes better at understanding how people work. I say it generally. Um, I've also worked in situations where that hasn't been the case and I've had to fight um, fight our corner. So um, really think about the company you're working for. And if the company isn't working for you and you've tried to change stuff, might be trying to find time to find a, another company, um, but they are out there. They, there are some really good employers out there, so don't let it put you off. Apparently, not in the UK though. Not in the UK. You can't find <laughs> not All problem. right, let's get into this last one here. This one's on the user experience subreddit by Bowie Bowie. Uh, an executive summary of a user flow question mark. Those of you that work with people or speak in PowerPoint, how do you present your user flows? More often than not, I end up talking through a PowerPoint of exported artboards where I explain motivations, suggestions, and highlight certain details. Is there a tool that provides a middle ground between completely functional and completely static user flows? I'd love to be able to include notes, navigation, arrows on the blank space outside the fully functional prototype being presented. Barry, just generally, how do you communicate user workflows uh, or flows within an interface or even just task flows in general? I, I'm PowerPoint, um, and that's mainly because my clients generally work with the um, uh, with Microsoft Suite. Therefore, if I want to export stuff, it can it goes with them. Um, but PowerPoint it, in itself is really, really powerful. It's way more powerful than people give it credit for. So you can use it in a kiosk mode where people use it um, as a complete. I mean, I've done aircraft uh, display um, prototyping with it, and you know because. I've got it so you can export that you can send that to pilot and they can play with it in their own time. And it's, it, it's not the same, but it go, does give you your flows and things like that. Um, equally, um, you can use it in, in, um, in ways that um, more step, you, you know, they're, they're more white body. So you, you can, you can step through things that way. Um, I have tried other tools, um, things like Figma do, do this sort of stuff quite well. Um, Visio to a certain extent can can make that play. 
Um, and th there are loads of other tools out there and there's more and more appearing on the market every day on the internet. The bit that I always struggle with, and particularly now with it, with us working remote so much more is the clients have got to be able to see what you're producing. The more, um, the, the, the cleverer the tool, the more expensive the tool is. And therefore the chance of your client being able to either have say Figma or something like that, if you can't export it properly, um, then they're not going to have it. Therefore, they're not going to be able to see it. Therefore, you're, wait, you're not necessarily wasting time, but you're going to have to cut it into a way that they that they have. Now, if you can create standalone models, brilliant. Um, the downside of that is if they don't don't export as HTML and they export as an executable, if you put an executable onto, into an email or something like that, chances are firewall is going to pick it up. The client's not going to be able to get it unless it's been sanitized. It's just a whole lot of stress. Um, so I do, um, and... I'm an old curmudgeon, so I do believe in keeping it simple. So I, it would take it takes a lot for me, and I've been I've tried different tools. Still, PowerPoint is my is my the one I go to. Nick, what about you? You're you're a bit more of a, a young go getter than I am. So, um, yeah. what, what do you use? Oh, PowerPoint. I mean, look, like here, here, uh, yeah, I agree with you entirely, and I've echoed that sentiment on the show before. The PowerPoint is is much more powerful than people do give it credit for. It is insanely. Uh, robust and accessible for a lot of different people, especially when you're working in something like defense where things are locked down and they can't open, like you said, some of those more fancy tools. And so, um, yeah, PowerPoint. But I think the the thing that I want to talk about is almost more abstract in nature, right? Like, what if you have this massive flow that you're trying to communicate um, that goes through a process, you know, role based, you have them almost in swim lanes and you have different tasks uh, at different times and coordination between those roles that gets more complex to share when you're looking at this massive flow with all these, you know, tasks along the way, decision points and everything. And for something like that, this is what I want to talk about, because I found that this really works for me is make that your product, make that pretty. Uh, as a deliverable because you can talk through it. Now, it does become a little bit more difficult to present something that large. However, I do want to like mention this. I've used a mini map in the past. So I've put, here's the entire task flow on the first slide. And then up in the top right corner, this is a mini map. And then you zoom in on little bits and pieces and talk through them as they make sense. Um, and so like, I'm going to walk you through this path first and kind of just do screenshot, 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 screenshot as it's going through that one path and then say, okay, here's the different way that could have gone, you know, and kind of loop you back. So there's a couple of different ways to approach that problem. Um, and I think that is the one trick tip that I want to pass along is mini maps. All right. Uh, any other closing thoughts on this one, Barry? The only other one that I've used that I thought was interesting and got away was a it was an app called Prezi, which was one oh, of these yeah. that is more animated that steps you through. I personally never got comfortable with it in a in a way that would allow me to do. But I, I really that whole sketching idea uh, that takes you from one to another. I kind of like that approach. Um, if I could find a tool that would do it, so that was one that was out there that was sort of good, and you could I I did get a little bit of traction with a client ones that was that was better than just just a slam door so um that might be worth looking at i don't know but that's me all right we're moving on to that last part of the show needs no introduction well it's right here right here it's one more thing uh this is where we just talk about one more thing human factors related or not barry what's your one more thing this week so i was and i've only got one so i'm i'm, I'm back to form um I was in a special interest group the other day. So the CIHF have a bunch of bu bunch of special interest groups. And this one was AI and digital. And in the agenda, um, which was kind of lucky because I hadn't actually read the agenda beforehand. I'm normally better organized than this, but I jumped into this very last minute. And one of the items was um, the whether Google had got a sentient AI or not. And and they were sort of discussing this. And I, I chipped in. I was like, oh, that sounds I, familiar. I'm, and say, I, I was talking about this just the other day. And they're like, were you? And I said, yes. And that by I, I, clearly, you guys don't listen to the podcast I'm part of. Um, I'm like, oh, what are you talking about? So I said that we that our last episode was, was on on Google Google AI. And um, 
and so I said, oh, could you put the uh, put the link in the chat? And so I put the link in the chat, and they all seemed to like it. So it was all I thought that was a nice link from what we do here into into direct application. That's nice, Barry. I don't I don't hear enough of those stories. If you have a story where you've uh, if if our listeners have a story where they've taken an episode and said, hey, they just talked about this, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, my one more thing this week is on automation. I talked a little bit about this in the pre-show. In fact, I talked a lot about this in the pre-show. I showed a whole diagram of what I you know made in terms of logic. Um, I just want to talk about sort of the reward that comes with banging your head against a task for hours and hours and hours in order to make your life easier because it really is right. Like I'm, I'm thinking about the amount of time I'm putting into something versus the amount of time that it is going to save me in automation in days, months, years time. I've just done something this week that is going to save me an hour every month. And so my return on investment, uh, you know, on this is going to be six months down the line because I spent about six hours on it. And so I'm really happy with that. It'll take a, a six months for it to pay for itself. But seeing everything happen just, you know, entirely automated is just insane and rewarding and would highly recommend it. Um, and I'll talk about Zapier. It's just an amazingly powerful tool for connecting your applications and having it just do things. Ah, no code. It's awesome. Uh, anyway, that's that's all I got. And that's it for today, everyone. If you like this episode, enjoy some of the discussion about improvements about flying in planes. I'll encourage you to go listen to episode 214, where we talk about games potentially improving in-flight passenger safety. Go comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the news story this week. Did you enjoy Barry's commentary? I certainly did. I'm going to go back and listen to it later because there were so many drops on my end. Anyway, for more in-depth discussion, you can join us on our Discord community. Uh, you can visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. Right now, you can go to whatever podcast reviewer you're on and leave us a five-star review. That's free for you to do. Uh, like Barry is saying, tell your friends about us. That really helps the show grow. People just might not know about us. And if you bring them a story like Google's AI, they might love it. So do that. And then three, if you have the financial means to do so, we have an entire separate podcast on Human Factors Minute, which is a little chunk of Human Factors every week. If you support us on Patreon over there at the Human Factors Engineer level or higher, you'll get access to that. As always, links to all of our socials and what our website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Mr. Barry Kirby for holding down the ship and carrying that conversation all by himself today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about what happens to what? What do you do if someone farts on you in these planes? <laughs> if you want to go and talk to me about flatulence or otherwise, um, hit me up at Twitter or on any socials, actually, at um, Baz underscore K. Or come listen to some of the interviews that we do on there. We sort of do more one to one interviews at uh, 12 or 2 podcast.com. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me disconnecting from our Discord server and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends.